Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. I'm your host, Miguel Nevsch, the editor-in-chief at Skiff Meetings. And in this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Andrei Sholovinsky, a longtime personal friend and also an expert event professional. Andrei is the associate director of meetings at the American Physical Society. And in our conversation, we share some of Andrei and I's journey in starting off in business events and how he went on to focus on the association sector. We talk about the way he managed the pivoting of large association events to digital format during the COVID pandemic. And we talk about what it's like to oversee one of the world's largest meetings of physicists, with 13,000 coming together for what is known as the American Physical Society's March meeting. We talk about the importance of creating a supportive and inclusive environment for all members. And we talk about the challenges around polarized political climates and how the American Physical Society has come around to actively supporting local causes rather than passively boycotting destinations. And finally, we talk about why scrappiness and the ability to adapt to daunting on-site challenges are the most important qualities Andre looks for when he is hiring for his team. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And if you do, please leave us a short review wherever you get your podcasts and consider sharing it with your network. Of course, don't forget to check out the other episodes of the Skiff Meetings podcast. Thanks for listening. And now for a word from our sponsors, PHL Life Sciences, a division of the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. Host your convention or trade show in Philadelphia, one of America's leading life sciences hubs. PHL Life Sciences, the first and only CVB division of its kind, will connect you to the professionals at the forefront of your industry and to a culture you can only find in Philadelphia. A city known for its rich history that's forging a bright future, Philadelphia challenges the expected and defies convention. A world of discovery is waiting. Visit phllife.com to learn more. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with someone that I've known for a very long time when it comes to events, particularly and in my personal life. So, Andre Sholovinsky, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Good morning, Miguel. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And uh, yes, we've uh, known each other for a, a few years, right? So A few years. So you are now the Associate Director of Meetings at the American Physical Society. Um, but I'd love you to start, um, well, tell us a little bit about your, your career and kind of tell us about where, where you started in events. Um, and I'd love you to start from any point of um, when you really came first into contact with events, with business events. You know, was it something at school? Was it at university? Was it through family? Start there, if you don't mind, and then let's take us through to today. All right, absolutely. It's um, it's it's actually an interesting story and one that uh, I share with a lot of people uh, my age, so to speak. I'm not going to age myself right now, but this was probably uh, early 2000s. Um, I was living in Portugal, just you know, trying to get by, find a job, do some things, and uh, there was a family uh, friend uh, who uh, used to work for a tour operator in Europe. So he organized big groups in Europe for incentive travels and sales missions and that kind of stuff. And he needed some assistance one day. And he said like, hey, Andre, you're available for some help? I'm like, sure. No clue what an incentive was, what it took to book travel, hotels or anything. But I was there ready and willing. And long story short, we did a a large corporate event down in the Algarve, which is southern Portugal. And... It was a seven-day incentive trip where we organized a bunch of business meetings, a bunch of fun activities like sailing regattas and off-roading things and all kinds of fun activities. And at the end of the uh, of the event, I uh, just simply fell in love with doing them and inquired about getting a position with him and helping him out on future events as it was A lot of fun. I enjoyed particularly the the dynamic aspect of it, having to think quickly on your feet and, you know, just making sure that these people who are trying to achieve something, you know, I was a part of of, of creating that structure for them and and, uh, ensuring that their business objectives were met, you know, so it was a lot of fun. And since then, it was just a history. I continued working with with incentives with that gentleman and stuff, and that you and I ended up working together on one of those incentives, which, uh, you know, the bug bit you, so to speak. The meetings bug bit you, so to speak, right? Um, yeah, we worked on a few, and then and then you um, 
eventually went over to the U.S., right? Sure, not that long after that. That is correct. I ended up marrying a half British, half American lady in Portugal. And uh, one day we were sitting on a balcony thinking what we're going to do with our futures. I still wanted to stay with events. This was about mid 2000, about 2005. Not the best time for meeting planners worldwide because of everything that was going on on a financial perspective on the global market. So uh, we were seeing a lot more uh, responses to RFPs and a lot fewer events. I started to not see the sustainability of that business model for myself in Portugal and uh, my wife at the time as well. She's a teacher and was disillusioned with the, her teaching career in Portugal. And fortunately, she had a family in Washington, D.C. here in the U.S. So we just looked at each other and said, like, hey, let's go. And we packed our bags and off we went um, without jobs. <laughs> You know, just kind of a, took a leap of faith there. I figured that somebody in D.C. with all the nonprofit societies and associations that are based in D.C., that someone could use someone like me with my skills. Um, arrived here, was a very tough time getting a job. Obviously, 2006, six seven wasn't the best of times financially. Um, however, I was able to to do some contract work. Uh, you and I, again, did, uh, did a couple of gigs together uh, as, as a contractor for you guys. And one day I am sitting at my desk and the gentleman who we did the contract work for gave me a call and said, there's a gentleman looking for a Portuguese speaking meeting planner. And I could not believe my luck. And uh, based in DC, the, the gentleman in question was, uh, there was a company called Planet at the time, it was a third party full service meeting management firm. They were doing a big conference in Brazil and his current meeting managers were having a very hard time in dealing with uh, the folks down in Brazil, making sure that everything moved forward, you know, doing business, especially in a Latin American country like Brazil is slightly different than what you'd expect to be doing it here in the U.S. You know, fortunately, I had uh, still connections there and everything. So I took the job on as a contractor, did a great job because obviously, you know, as, as, as Latin Americans, I, I, I was born in Brazil myself uh, originally called him up and said like, hey, make Andre look good, please. <laughs> and uh, off we went. It was, a, it was a large, large event for about 500 people. Everything went super well. Everybody was really happy. And on the flight home, I got offered a job, full, full term permanent position as the manager of site selection on his behalf. Um, so then I ended up spending a few years with him doing managing site selection for the third party for multiple different clients. I was primarily assigned to the international projects just by the virtue of having done international events myself. So um, that made sense. So a quick jump in international events, right? It's just a quick... Uh... <laughs> And then I was also assigned to oversee the, the registration department because we did a lot of registration solutions for clients at the time as well. You know, so I spent a few years with him through 2012 where um, I uh, made a connection with the, the, the at the time, the current uh, capital, the PCMA capital chapter president, Hunter Clements at the time. And... Um, he uh, had a position open as for an associate director of meetings and global events. And, you know, I, I jumped on the opportunity because it was an association management company. And my interest had gone more away from corporate events, incentive travel, travel related kind of hospitality events to a real focus on, on associations. You know, having spent that time with a third party, a lot of my clients were nonprofits and associations. So started getting more and more interested in that world and what association management looks like and, and what are those organizations run like at the time. And, you know, was fortunate enough to get the job, you know, spent what about eight, nine years working for the association management company with, with clients from a variety of different industries, which was super interesting as well, because you get to learn a little bit about how the demographics of different types of stakeholders work and, how those nonprofits are managed and, and, and what are the similarities, you know, and, and, and the fun aspect of it, we had about 24 different nonprofits that we were managing at the time. And they were by virtue of them being in, a, in an association management company, they were small, small budget, small operating budgets, which is why they were under that umbrella. So it was interesting to be able to kind of work the meetings for those clients and then take best practices, best lessons learned from each one and apply them to each other, what to do, what not to do. Excuse me. 
Then towards the end of my tenure with the, with the association management company, we were bought out by an international PR agency firm. And, and unfortunately, they took a kind of a different uh, direct the company in a different direction that didn't really resonate with me because I really wanted to stay within the, the true association management aspect of it. And I had never worked directly for a nonprofit myself. And an opportunity came up at the time to uh, get the job as the senior director of meetings for the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, which I readily jumped upon uh, because I had the opportunity now to be inside a standalone association larger than any of my clients that I had previously worked with, as well as have the title of senior director of meetings and oversee the entire meetings function for that nonprofit. And that was super interesting. That was in 2019. Um, you know, it went really well. I mean, academic pharmacy isn't exactly the most exciting field. However, it is supporting a very important field. So for me, it's always been really important to be supporting an industry where I really believe in, where I really feel like I am making my contribution and a difference to them, right? And that was super, super interesting up until COVID hit us in March of 2020 and everything pivoted to the virtual world. You know, as most of us in the in that world, meeting planners particularly, we were very fast and putting on our different hats on our heads and pivot everything to a virtual world. I had very little experience at the time in doing virtual events, um, you know, and uh, by the virtue of the clients I had in the AMC, their budgets never supported having a virtual or a digital component to their meetings. And neither did the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy up until we were kind of strong handed into doing it. Um, so I had about three months to pivot my annual meeting into a virtual format. And fortunately, we were able to find a great vendor that we worked with at the time. My team also rallied behind me. And we were able to pull off a great annual meeting with great engagement and a lot more attendance than we had ever seen at one of our annual meetings previously. And I know that this story is not uh, unique in any sense of the word because literally the whole world came to a grinding halt at the time, right? So then I pivoted all our meetings that we were doing in a virtual world. I did take my digital event strategy certification. More to learn versus having an extra certification under my belt, uh, just to see like what's what's out there, what's new, what's not. Um, and um, so, yeah, so that went really, really, really well up until, we, you know, 21, we start coming out of the, the, the pandemic. Um, things start shifting back into normal. Academic pharmacy isn't the most fast paced environment, you know, it's pretty structured. And I'd always grown up in an environment where my meetings had to be like really nimble on my feet fast, shift directions from one second to the other. And I found myself going into more of a play in a repeat mode, play, stop, repeat, play, stop, repeat. So started seeking something a little bit more challenging for myself. And then this opportunity came up with the American Physical Society, APS. Okay. Where I could, uh, where I uh, applied for a role as the associate director of meetings uh, for the organization, which would be a, a, a more of a tactical uh, position overseeing the meetings department at the American Physical Society, and I jumped on that, and uh, fortunately enough, I was able to be offered a job uh, in the beginning of uh, May uh, of 2022, okay. and uh, kind of like the rest is history, really, so to speak, you know. APS is a much larger organization than I'd ever worked at. We're about 300 employees overall. Um, the primarily revenue driver for APS, however, are the journals uh, uh, component of APS, the, the journals division. Uh, we have all the top physics journals in the world, and that kind of draws that world together. Uh, however, we also have the world's largest physics meeting, of uh, the, the largest congregation of, of scientists specifically for physics in the world as well, along with a whole bunch of other meetings, a growing team. So, you know, I, I looked at that opportunity. Yes, was it going to be a challenge? Absolutely. But I welcomed that challenge and I dove head in and, you know, it's I'm coming up almost on two years. Congrats. Give me some headline figures, like how many events, what size is this largest one that you mentioned? So the largest event that we do is our March meeting, which really should be called our annual meeting, but just some scientists 
I don't know how long ago decided to call it the March meeting. And the funny thing is, even if our March meeting doesn't fall on March, it could fall in January, February, March, April sometimes. It's still called the March meeting. Um, and, the, and, that, and that's truly the, 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 the largest meeting that we do. It brings together about 13,000 uh, scientists from all over the world. I'd say about 30 to 35 percent of our attendance is internationally based. 20 to 30 percent will probably be our graduate student, undergraduate student, you know, research students, that kind of thing, and then uh, main scientists. Um, so that's, that means I mean, 13,000, that's 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 a pretty large event. I mean, when you're looking at destinations, I'm assuming mostly US, right? US destinations. Yes. I mean, how many destinations are available to you? Because 13,000 already eliminates quite a few, right? Why right. that does eliminate quite a few, but there's another component to that meeting that eliminates even more, which is we do on average between 75 and 80 concurrent education sessions for five days. Okay. And the interesting part of it, out of the 13,000 attendees, about 10,000 of those are speakers. So majority of the people that are attending my meeting are also presenting at the meeting. So they do these scientific talks where they talk for 12 minutes and they have a three minute Q&A. They talk for 10 minutes, they do a three minute Q&A across 70, this year we had 78 concurrent sessions, oh, last year I should say, because in 2023. And it just runs like that for five days. Uh, with a bunch talking of- about poster sessions, like small presentations, like it goes from, ranges from a big keynote stage to a, a couple of people talking over a campfire, that kind of thing. Uh, now, the interesting part is we do not do your traditional, what you would say, general sessions, keynotes or plenary sessions, which is which is an interesting aspect of it, because this meeting brings together a whole bunch of different divisions of APS. And though the science is similar, they're very specific in, in the science that they give. So it almost becomes like tracks on site, if you will. Now, we do do two main kind of sessions that are available to all the people attending, which is our Cavley session, which brings the top scientific minds in the world talking about the latest kind of physics research, physics things done. And then also every year by October, once Nobel decides who is winning the, the, the Nobel Prize for Physics, the Nobel Prize for Peace, Biology, Chemistry, et cetera, we invite especially the Nobel Physics winner, um, but also the other Nobel laureates. And we have a Nobel laureate session that we do on site that that's open as well, which is which is a pretty neat aspect, you know, being able to talk to someone who's just figured out how to take a picture of a black hole, for example, right? Yeah. These are so, smart people, right? These are kind of people a little bit on it, you know, so yeah. And again, it's 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 support again like what I mentioned earlier where where I find myself in a position where I'm supporting a community that does truly important work for humanity, if sure. you will. And it's it's just really gratifying to be able to to be that cog in the wheel of what these guys do and rub shoulders with the smartest minds in the world. You mentioned guys, and I don't know if it was intentionally male, um, but I assuming your meeting is mainly male. Do you have any statistics on on the kind of split of male and female? I don't have that readily available, but I could definitely pull that up for you if you wanted to kind of mention something post. But yes, it is it is primarily male uh, driven. However. APS has a lot of programs and initiatives in place where we're supporting women in physics. We have a whole program that just supports women in physics. We have another program that supports minority women in physics. Um, APS is a truly kind of inclusive and diverse environment. And, and so is our, 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 our community, our community of scientists. They're truly a diverse group of people from people who work at top security national laboratories to professors at uh, the largest universities in the world. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's a really uh, interesting, diverse population that we bring. So we make, we make a point out of that. All our meetings, we do do programs that are aimed at these minority groups, you know, whether they'll be LGBTQIA plus uh, folks or women in minority or, you know, minorities in general in the physics world and, and we're trying to figure out how can we create a community that's more inclusive for these people overall in the physics world, right? So yeah, that very interesting. makes you think on a 360 kind of approach, so to speak. Sure. 
Are you ready to celebrate your successes in the world of meetings and events? The Skift Meetings Awards are back for 2024, recognizing the most innovative business events companies across 15 categories, and we want you to be a part of it. Winners will feature on Skift Meetings, sending a clear signal to events professionals around the world that these are partners they can rely on. The final deadline for submissions is June 11th. We encourage you to start your submission today to secure the best entry rates. For more information and to start your submission, head to live.skift.com. Zooming out a little bit, and this is a fun question that I like to ask uh, our guests. Um, when you speak to people that are not in the industry, uh, family and friends, perhaps, how do you explain what you do? Huh, that is a great question, because I still think my parents think I'm a wedding planner. Um, <laughs> you know, it's tough, but it's, it's, it's also interesting. I'll take it to the next level, because with the, the scientists as well that I work with every day, you know, the most brilliant minds in the world, will sometimes not comprehend the functions that we have to do on our level, right? So, you know, I try to look at it and I try to explain to, you know, I have a five-year-old at home, so that's a great example. He asked me, daddy, what do you do for a living? And I said, I do meetings. And he kind of looks at me and he goes like, what? And then I kind of have to think about it. Like, well, how do I make him understand? So I say to him, for example, I told him the other day, I'm like, hey, you like uh, Pokemons, right? Yes, yes, I like Pokemons. I'm like, okay. Well, imagine you want to get together with like 50 friends of yours in school and other schools that also love Pokemons and, and trade cards. He goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And like, so that is the person that figures out how we get all these people invited, how we find a place for all of them to meet together and set up a schedule for you guys to specifically get together and talk about these types of Pokemons and then talk about those other types of Pokemons. Um but it is tough to explain it to, in a way that people will uh, understand that are outside of our of our industry who have no idea that this is an industry even, you know. Yep. It's tough. It's not easy, you know. So what about this, you know, speaking the language of the C-suite, right? You you you've you've had you've held some very interesting positions in your career. I imagine that you have to speak this language of physics, perhaps at the moment, right? I mean, it's not just, I mean, I'm sure there is business imperatives of the society, but there's also a sort of different way of thinking. How do you kind of manage to speak to these people? How do you communicate with these, these professors, these scientists, these people that understand the world in probably a different way to the way we do and, and explain the needs and, you know, what you need to pull off a successful event, but what the event needs to be profitable or to be successful in some way. Right. No, that's a that's a great question because that's always been a little bit of a challenge throughout my entire career and 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 getting them to understand the language we speak and the language that I speak with them and vice versa, so to speak. Um, so I always try to like sit down, especially if it's if it's the beginning of my tenure at any position or previously when I was working with a new client is I try to sit down with the CEO or president and truly understand what their vision is for what they are trying to achieve, right? Um, and understanding what the goals and objectives are that they hold behind running their organization, really, you know? And, and, I, and I kind of try to transpose that into looking at, well, how am I going to deliver on creating what I call this infrastructure for these people to congregate and gather and get together and achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve, right? Whether it's giving research, educating, or just a talk or networking, right? So I really try to understand what the top kind of tier goals and objectives are of the meeting, you know? And then I start talking about what are the different options of how we can achieve that, right? And also like at the same time, understanding the history of the organization as well. What, what have they done traditionally? What hasn't been done? And truly understand and, and, and helping them understand of how I can leverage certain aspects of the functions that we do as meeting planners, so to speak, to the favor of the organization and its members. Because I always look as, and I always have looked at uh, meetings and events, conferences, conventions, seminars, they're really a fundamental part of the member benefits of that association, right? So at the same time, as I kind of gear my thinking towards the C-suite, I always grab the membership department as well and, and, and truly try to understand what, how are we pitching? What are the member benefits? Why do people join this association, a nonprofit or society? 
what do they gain out of it, right? And and then how are we delivering on it? Because I always found that meetings, events, conferences, it's probably one of the top member benefits that they get from uh, from being a member of a of an organization, right? So it is really important that I deliver on that promise that the that the organization is giving its members and charging its members for it, right? So you know, understanding that aspect of it, coupling in with me understanding what the C suite is really their vision is like even the one to two year vision and have them walk me through their strategic plan because, you know, APS is, is an organization, even the, its internal staff, I would say probably 80 to 85% of its staff are physicists as well, right? So, you know, truly just understanding what it is that we're trying to achieve here and, and how can I leverage that on their behalf so that we're delivering on that member promise, right? So... Sounds like good advice. Let's flip to the other side of the, the coin. So, I mean, in your role, you, you're you part of the destination selection process, venue selection, hotels, AV. There's so many different kind of partners that you have to deal with, set up, choose, all these different functions. What's your kind of north star when it comes to this kind of stuff? I mean, is it is it the price? Is it the negotiation? Is it you know, the destination just is and there's nothing you can do about it. How do you look at kind of finding the right partners for, for your needs? Boy, that's a loaded question in so many ways, but I'll... I'll... And I don't, I'm not asking for details or names, yeah, but so, what's like your I mean, approach to it? My, my overarching 30,000 approach to it is I want to find a true partner. That's really what I'm looking for. I'm not trying to find a vendor. I'm trying to find someone that is going to be committed to the APS initiatives that we're doing with them and and come to the table as a true partner versus a vendor that just listens to what I need and waits for me to tell them what I need. So let's take a, a decorator, a general services contractor, for example, right? Um, you know, when I came on, on, on with APS, we historically, they had used one decorator for a lot of meetings that fell through. And, and when I came in with all the meetings that we do, we do nine large, large annual meetings a year, along with 30 plus other meetings, you know, and a lot of those meetings do require decorator services. And, but they were, the team was kind of look, hiring one for this one, hiring another for this one, hiring another for this one. And, and just the resource and time expenditure required and having to do that for each individual meeting was, was incredible. Right. So I kind of look at it like, well, let's find a decorator that will take care of all of our meetings, right? Number one, I'll have a I'll have a set agreement with them and 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 I can create a consistency across the board with who my team works with and how stuff is kind of created on site, right? Especially at the larger meetings when we do a lot of build outs, there's an exhibit hall and all of that stuff. I want that consistency. But I also am looking at that vendor, so to speak, to become a partner. So I expect them to come to the table, especially during initial kickoff meetings, brainstorming sessions with ideas, with thoughts, especially after they've worked with us for a while, they start getting to know our demographics and the, the particularities of, of, of the individual meetings that we do and, and bring something to the table that I can apply that's new and fresh and, and different, right? Um, so that's kind of primarily my approach to vendors. Uh, in regards to site selection, that, that is a trickier uh, approach, especially this past year with APS, because as we know, politics kind of does influence a lot of what we do. And, you know, we've all heard of the, the, the problematic laws, if you want to call it that, that certain states in the U.S. particularly have, where, where it comes to, you know, women's health rights, for example, right? So... Our council, so there's lots of layers in APS as well. We have a board and council, and then we have a committee on scientific meetings. The committee on scientific meetings really is a smaller committee made up of extremely experienced scientists. Um, and they have like a chairline whole thing going on there. But they take a look at it in terms of how are we delivering our meetings to our members, right? And they take a look at all different aspects. And site selection was one of them because uh, some destinations became problematic, if you will, for some of our units in particular, you know, I've, you know, some of the units didn't want to meet in this particular state anymore because they felt like the laws that in the state were going against the beliefs of, of, of what APS should stand for, as well as going against the immediate belief of certain scientists, right? There's a, there's a pretty large component of the LGBTQIA plus 
we have a large community across all our divisions and you know in certain states it would almost be a criminal activity for them to even be up on a stage giving a talk right we've, we've written a lot about travel boycotts and and other things like that so but how is that actually impacting you directly i'm, I'm very curious well, because then we have to really kind of lace the site selection. So with the, commi the, 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 the Committee on Scientific Meetings, we've developed a new site selection kind of procedure, so to speak, where, you know, we do the normal RFP details that we need. Here's my room block. Here's all the space I need. Here's how much food I'm going to consume, et cetera. However, we now look at destinations from the lens of, well, let's analyze what are the current laws in that destination and how do they impact the the the, the APS kind of mindset, so to speak. Um, we look at local policing laws as well, like what are the policing statistics? What's the police departments doing in those cities that kind of helps create a more inclusive environment for the city itself, really, you know, because we want to make sure that the destinations are safe for our members to be at as well. And then coupled with that, we also look now more specifically at sustainability initiatives that not only the city is doing, but the individual venues and vendors that we're using as well. So we lace all of that and we also use the human rights campaign score, which is something super interesting. You can go on individual cities and see how they rank on the human rights campaign score. And that's everything from you know criminal statistics to LGBTQIA friendliness etc. So it, it does become a much more involved and more drawn out process because I got to get that RFP out, analyze it, figure out how I'm going to present it to these scientists so that they can see it apples to apples from multiple destinations, you know, and then we have to get with the executive committee and talk about it merits of each one and kind of uh, take that approach. However, I, I was always a strong adamant about boycotting does not solve the problem, right? Because we've had some units wanting to boycott and we've actually were successful in us not boycotting, boycotting those destinations because number one, first, I feel like you always do a disservice to your members that are locally there as well. But if you just boycott and you leave a destination, you're like, oh, I'm not going to hold my convention there. Forget about it. Really, the people you're hurting, number one, are the local members. And, and the local people that your meeting would impact. So all the banquet and server staff, you know, people working at the hotels, mm -hmm. restaurants, services, all of that. And I, it may make a point, even some organizations, it may even pop up in the news, right? But however, if you boycott the destination and that's all you do, that's in my opinion, considered extreme passive boycotting because what are you doing to, at the end of the day, to help that cause? You're really not because you've just boycotted, you've had to pay a hefty cancellation fee. So you've lined someone's pockets at a hotel or a convention center or somebody running it. And you've really not done, unless you do something to follow up on that particular topic that was the reason why you boycotted, then it's it really doesn't serve to support that purpose at the end of the day. I'm not sure if I made myself clear there, but no, you, you do. Know. I think we've, we've covered this quite a lot on skiff meetings and, and there's a, we spoke to merits recently and they're using a, um, an organization called social offset that actually is a, you know, you, you find a, um, a cause at a destination or it helps you find a cause at the destination and provide financial, uh, benefit to that, um, cause, which is, you know, one way of, not boycotting right because i think the, the challenge here is that there's this idea of silent boycotting where you know you're excluding a destination right off the bat like you were talking about like uh, you know just it's not even being considered so, right i mean exactly and that's very passive and then there's the active boycotting which which all, which is only really visible if somebody has a meeting and then cancels it later right which is which is a very unfortunate situation of course there's fees etc which is really really bad so it's really interesting to understand how you're dealing with that and how you're actually choosing not to boycott but then if you choose not to boycott and you go to a destination that may be uh, controversial let's say are you actively doing things then at the destination yeah, no, so we do do mitigating strategies as well leading up to it, because another aspect of this is the trickiness of I'm booking now 25, 6, 7, 8, 9 in certain instances, right? So am I basing my 27 potential booking on the climate that we're living in today? 
it's going to change, right? They can next this year is a pivotal year here in the U.S. in politics, for example. What's going to change after the the, the Fed the, the 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 elections this year, for example, right? So, you know, so we do try and and funny enough, you mentioned merits. Merits is my housing partner as well, and we've just been talking to them about this specific uh, issue as well in terms of of, of 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 finding a cause and supporting that cause that needs support and help from an uh, from an organization such as APS, you know. Mm-hmm. So we try to identify local causes, you know, like I said, the, the whole LGBTQIA plus DEI community, we are very active in that area. So we try to find local people that we can support that are, are being affected by these uh, adverse laws. Um, and I also want to mention a lot of people will sometimes, and even these most brilliant minds in the world, will will base their kind of perceptions on what they hear on the news. So what they hear on X, the former Twitter or or what they hear from someone without actually verifying if that's true in that destination yeah. as well. You know, there's a lot of noise out there that you have to figure out how to filter out the noise and get to the root of it before you base a major decision. You know, and in my case, my my March meeting, it's multi-million dollar decisions, right? So, you know. This just goes to show how important the de- perception of a destination is, right? And And that's not necessarily something that, you can control, you know, working in this industry. I think destinations have certain perceptions, and that's that's way beyond our control, right? Create a good uh, good partner relationship with that city, with that destination, with that local DMO that you're working with, right? And explain to them what is really important to your organization, because they will be your biggest partner in supporting you and navigating this, right? Especially as we're booking future years, we don't know what the politics is going to be then, you know, but as long as the city and they are aware of what it is that your hot buttons are and what you really need to be able to host your event there, they'll be your biggest support in helping you create mitigating strategies for it, you know? Yeah, I like that. Well, thanks for thanks for covering that with us. Wanted to cover a little bit in terms of your look at building your team, right? Hiring, uh, finding the right people. Uh, We're going, we're reporting a lot on companies finding it very hard to find talent, both at the senior level, but also at the junior level. Um, what are you seeing out there and how are you dealing with it? So my fortunate aspect of that, I don't have as, as hard of a time, if you will, maybe as as maybe some other organizations. And number one is because APS has gone fully remote. So we're one, we're, we're a 100% remote organization um, as of about two years ago. Um, and that actually creates a bigger pool for me to look into for for potential hires, right? So it is it is it is a challenge finding good good candidates out there because there's a lot of competition for them. However, I am not limited by geographical boundaries, so to speak. I mean, I have to keep it within the United States right now just because of employment laws and all of that. Uh, we do make an exception here and there. We actually hired a C-suite person in England, but on a more tactical uh, tactical level we didn't i've also grown the team tremendously since since i've uh, joined APS. i feel like i think we've hired about eight new people to join the team just by the necessity of the work that we do our meetings have been growing we've been adding meetings as well a lot of units previously at APS were managed by an external third party and I've successfully managed to bring those in under a fold, but bringing in an annual meeting into the meetings department requires us to hire a new manager, coordinators, and all of that. You know, so I've been truly fortunate in, in, in being able to look at a pool of applicants and, and talent that's US wide, that's not really bound by them having to be in the local DC region. So that's been truly fortunate, you know, and 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 finding also the people with the right background, right? Because I mean, scientists, they're not the easiest bunch to work with, you know, they have its particularities. Scientific meetings have an aspect to them that you don't see in other types of of of, of industries. So finding people with the right kind of attitude and, and mentality of how they do it, but also with the experience. I mean, it has been challenging, but I've been very fortunate and, and successful in that in that area. So and do you look for things like the DES and CMP when you're, when you're doing the hiring? I do. I do. Absolutely. The DES is important to me because that's another mandate that APS has that came down from our committee on scientific meetings is that every single meeting that we do has to have a virtual slash digital component, if you will, to it, um, which, 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 which definitely is important. So a CMP is important to me as well, um, you know, and then. 
those kinds of designations just shows me the commitment that that person has to the industry and, and to their own kind of professional career. And, you know, it just allows them to rise above the applicant stack if somebody doesn't have it. Now, that doesn't mean I, I discard someone just because they don't have that certification, because like myself, I got my CMP pretty late on in my career, if you will. You know, and, and I was just more of a procrastinator and I was like, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then I finally did it. And wow, boy, did I feel proud for having achieved that. Right. So but that doesn't mean I disqualify someone from the role as a potential candidate just because they don't have one of those. Right. So it's for me, it's just looking more at their background, what they've done, what they've achieved and kind of what their vision is for the future as well. You know, for me, it's like the biggest asset and a meeting manager is I, I it's funny I, I call them i need someone that's scrappy right i need someone that's going to be on site and if the building collapses around them they know what to do right away they're just going to spring into action versus panicking and running away from it you know love it adding scrappy to the resume now i can see hundreds of people right. doing that. Scrappy, right. andre pleasure talking to you thank you for sharing all these different aspects of your work and your outlook on meetings and events I want to get a recommendation from you for somebody else who we should have as a guest on a podcast. All right. Yes. Yeah. So I have a couple of people that I could think of. And one of them is Deirdre Clements. Um, I know she is uh, currently looking for a role. However, she was for, I guess, well over a decade, the vice president of meetings for Airports Council International North America. She is an amazing lady with a lot of meeting experience and has been through the ringer in many different aspects, especially on the international stage. She recently did a little stint with ASAE. And uh, though I know she's looking for a role now, I think she would be a true asset to this podcast because you would gain some uh, uh, very interesting insights from her. So I'd be happy to, to make the introduction for you and recommend her to you. Perfect. I, I, I appreciate it. Andre, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you and sharing your career with us and uh, wishing you lots of success with the March meeting, which should be coming up soon and all the other meetings that I know you have lined up. I have a March meeting coming up right now. So absolutely, I appreciate that. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm happy to keep that discussion going if, if you want to. Too. Perfect. Thank you.